Welcome to Finextra TV. I'm Hannah Wallace, and today I'm kindly joined by Greg Hansel, manager of Global Ford Consulting at OneSpan. Hello, Greg. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Hannah. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, this is by no means a light topic, Ford in financial services. So I'm going to get you to start by highlighting some of the main challenges we're seeing in this area. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, the main challenge that I, I believe we have is uh, account takeover uh, fraud. Um, the reason for that, uh, it's actually increasing year on year. Mm -hmm. uh, we see that from uh, 2017 to 2018, um, there's been a, an increase of 162% according to our new data, and we're expecting it to increase again. Mm -hmm. And if we think about why it might increase, um, in the past, if you um, wanted to obtain somebody's details, maybe you'd have to um, perform reconnaissance, uh, stand in the street, steal their wallet, things like this. It's a very manual task. It would take quite some time. Um, whereas now, what you can actually do is you could uh, perform a phishing attack, um, whereby you could send emails to users or include malware, uh, and that can infect their device and therefore obtain data. Or if it's a phishing attack, then they would click on a link and then provide their identity uh, and their credentials. Um, so the way that people can arrive at this information is much faster now. Uh, and also the way that they can then use that data can be automated as well. What we know is that la uh, last year and the year before, there was roughly uh, 3.2 billion records uh, compromised. Uh, so what we should think is our identity is not our own. It's, it's in the market now. Uh, and there are um, malicious actors in this space that run um, crime as a service now. Uh, where they actually sell these identities online. So if you're an attacker, you can very easily obtain this information and then perform an account takeover. Um, the account takeover as well, as you say, it doesn't stop there. Mm -hmm. uh, if we think about um, how that can propagate, uh, if you are a, a, a customer, that, that might result in a new beneficiary or application for a new product, um, or there might be a full account takeover where they would actually remove your device and lock you out. Um, and or potentially compromise your recovery mm -hmm. uh, email address and phone numbers. And so uh, financial institutions need to think not only um, what's the risk of their data being taken, so their username, their password, but also a recovery process that mm -hmm. is used as well. For me, account takeovers uh, is a, a big problem for financial institutions. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you really want to get in there before the hacker does. So how are financial institutions going to do better at detecting and mitigating these account takeover fraud attacks? I believe that we need to um, reflect and think about uh, what, is, what is trust um, and how do financial institutions think about um, users and their data and, and their devices. And what we need to consider is that trust is not static. It is, uh, it is dynamic. It is uh, ever-changing. Mm -hmm. um, and why, is that, why that's important is, uh, if we think about in the past, um, the way that we would authenticate users might be on login or uh, on the transaction. Um, whereas now, what we have is an abundance of data because uh, we have come into the, into the web or into mobile banking, mm -hmm. and there are events that are constantly streaming um, to the financial institutions as a user progresses through their user journey. This means that it lends itself well to continuous monitoring. And that's the capability to monitor all of the events that are occurring. Um, so not just the login and the transaction, but also requesting of a balance or creating a new beneficiary yeah. um, or creating a user or changing users. Also, we need to think about uh, the session as well, um, because it might not just be one device uh, that, is, that is used to log in and to authenticate. It might happen from a web um, device where they will log in and then authentication from the mobile device. Uh, the risk on both devices is different, yet the session is the same, so it needs unifying and something needs to determine uh, how, how that risk is for both of these devices mm -hmm. and how it correlates to their behaviour. Behaviour is a big point uh, and that lends itself to machine learning. Um, so uh, what is the normal user behaviour? How do they interact with the devices um, in terms of typing, swipe, drag? Um, uh, speed across uh, pages, things like this, but also how do they interact with the sessions as well? So when do they establish a, a web session or a mobile banking session? Um, how do they move through these pages? What pages do they visit in what order? Uh, because what you can do is actually profile the speed of a user and where they go to and contrast that very quickly against a bot, for example. Um, but also um, profile it from a behaviour in terms of spend as well. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a, quite a challenge for, for banks in that 
They typically have um, lots of uh, fraud solutions in place, but they have a gap there in terms of product risk in digital banking and mobile banking. Um, so many financial institutions now are looking to bring in a, um, a solution that does continuous monitoring mm -hmm. in their web sessions, uh, but also there's a shortage of experts in it globally. Um, I think it's estimated there's a shortage of 1.1 million people by 2021, financial cybercrime experts. Uh, so also the uh, financial institutions are going through a knowledge uh, process where they're gaining the information around indicators of compromise in web sessions, mm -hmm. uh, as well as a process evolution as well. I certainly feel like we could talk about this for a lot longer, but I'd love to hear about your take on the regulators and how they're addressing these problems. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, regulators have really been uh, present these last, uh, last years. Uh, we see that mainly from, from my perspective with um, Payment Services Directive 2 and uh, GDPR as well. Of course. Um, with Payment Services Directive 2, what they're doing is actually uh, challenging um, what is uh, a strong customer authentication. Um, so a, a user um, authenticating with a one-time password, uh, in my view, is, is not necessarily enough. Uh, and and um, Payment Services Directive 2 also referenced that and explained that there needs to be a capability to dynamically link back. Um, so again, that brings in context. Why is somebody authenticating? What are they authenticating on? And derive the signature or the one-time password based upon that context. So for example, the beneficiary, the amount and the date. That's crucial. That way then users are not simply um, uh, arriving at a one-time password that they do not know about. Mm -hmm. It is derived from their data. So they, ha they have context and also the financial institution has context as well. On top of that, um, there's also the requirement to uh, apply um, identification of malware in the authentication process. Uh, so um, the, the banks or the financial institutions are looking to, uh, to identify malware. Uh, and that's, that's quite a challenge uh, because if we think about phishing attacks, uh, phishing attacks are relatively simple to identify because mm -hmm. the end user doesn't have a session with the bank. Um, in a, a malware scenario, actually it's the end user's device. Uh, so um, in that sense, the regulators are driving forward another um, innovation towards machine learning um, because ultimately um, your, your rules will not identify malware. So actually you need to take in lots of data points, profile, understand, is it a user, is it a bot that's interacting in that mm -hmm. session, in that device, what speed are they at, and if there's anything, any other indicators of compromise that can be identified from that. Um, with uh, GDPR, uh, what, I, what I would say is they are changing the way that we think about um, uh, privacy around, around data. Uh, in the past, for example, we would say that PII would be uh, anything relating to, to me as a person. Mm -hmm. But the reality is because of the capability to identify people from their devices and from their locations, this is now being challenged and being classified as PII as well. Okay. Um, so that is also influencing um, how you can collect information around the device and how you can collect information around the IP as well um, and how that can relate back to the user. Ultimately, that's driving um, a security change in what um, applications are doing with that data. And that is applying encryption right the way through, encrypting their databases and ensuring that this type of data cannot be uh, obtained or sniffed or, or received in the middle as well. So, yeah, I think regulators are having a, a big impact. On well, Greg, you've certainly painted the picture for us and I mm. think it's safe to say watch this space. Yeah. Um, but for now, thank you very much for sharing your insights. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.